physics experiments that we performed with a high-powered laser at the large plasma device in Los Angeles. And the motivation for this work comes from, from space physics. So we're trying to simulate magnetized collisional shock waves. Those are shocks that are mediated by magnetic reflection that you find in the heliosphere. And the best example is a planetary bow shock, such as the Earth bow shock. So this is a little schematic here. If you, look, you have the solar wind coming in at high superphonic speed, and when it meets the, an obstacle here, which is the Earth magnetosphere, uh, it's launching a shock wave. And depending where you look at and what the angle is between the shock normal and the interplanetary magnetic field, you can either have a perpendicular shock, which is called a magnetosonic shock wave, where you have a well-defined shock ramp that's relatively small. Um, or if you look here, where the, the shock normal is more aligned with the, with the magnetic field, then you, you create a so-called parallel or alphanic shock wave, which is much more diffuse. There's a lot of turbulence and waves upstream and downstream. And in the experiment, we try to reproduce this situation by ablating a laser plasma. So this is a picture. There's a target that uh, is irradiated with a high intensity of laser, and a plasma ablates at superaphanic speed into a preformed ambient plasma. And so here, the laser plasma acts as piston that is moving, and the ambient plasma is stationary. In, in space, the piston is the magnetosphere, and it's stationary, and the, the plasma is the solar wind, which is moving. But in the shock frame, the situation is exa exactly the same. And so my, the, the convenient thing about the experiment is we can change the orientation of the laser plasma relative to the magnetic field. So we can study both magnetosonic and alphanic shock waves. And my talk is split in two parts. First, I'll talk about the perpendicular case, and then the parallel case. The main goal of the experiment is to investigate shock formation. This is something that can only be that can, cannot be done easily in space, since shocks in space are the steady state. They always exist. Shock formation is relevant to shock reformation and also to the dissipation. How does the shock decelerate the incoming plasma? And then, of course, it's interesting for code validation. Uh, in particular, hybrid codes have been used in the past to study space shocks, but they are, uh, they're facing several challenges when they're applied to much smaller systems that are comparable to the, to the relevant scale length, such as comets or man-made explosion and these laboratory experiments. So the work is performed at the large plasma device, LAPD, in Los Angeles. This is a user facility for basic plasma science. And Walter Geckelman is here. He's giving the next talk. He will talk more about it, I'm sure. For the purpose of this talk, I just want to say it produces these large magnetized plasmas. It's almost 20 meters long, half a meter diameter. The plasma density is, is around 10 to the 13 per cubic centimeter at 10 electron volts. And there are magnetic field coils that produce an axial magnetic field of several hundred gauss along the machine. It's pulsed on once a second by, by a, a discharge, but it is current free. It's essentially steady state, so the lifetime is several milliseconds. And it's highly reproducible. And for these shock experiments, we use a high power laser that is coupled to the LAPD. The laser fires uh, is fired on a, on a solid target inside the preformed plasma, and it, we're creating these exploding plasmas at superphonic speed. The purpose of the laser plasma is to act as a magnetic piston to launch shocks in the ambient plasma. And because we have this flexible geometry, we can, we can look at perpendicular, oblique, or parallel shocks. Uh, since the plasma is so large, the shock can fully separate from the piston, so eventually, the shock is, is a, the, the piston is just energizing the background, and the shock is propagating within the, the ambient plasma. It's independent of the, of the specifics of the driver. And also, since the plasma is large enough to support alphane waves, they can participate in the evolution of the shock, which is very important for the, for the parallel shock. And then lastly, everything is low pressure, so we can stick in probes and do local measurements of plasma parameters. So the first part I want to talk about is the magnetosonic shock, so perpendicular to the field. And this is a schematic of, of 
the experimental setup. This is one section of the LAPD, so the, the plasma is going this way. There's a magnetic field is pointing along the plasma column. And we have a solid target coming in from the top. It's plastic, so carbon and hydrogen. And the laser beam is coming in from here at an angle. It strikes the target. The surface of the target is pointing to the right. And the laser blades always perpendicular to the surface, so exactly across the field. So we're only using about 50 centimeters of the plasma. We don't, do not take advantage of the full length of, of, of the embedded plasma in this case. Um, and we have probes, such as magnetic flux probes or fibers coming in that can probe the magnetic field at different distances from the target. And this is a picture of the laser plasma when it is very small, just a couple of nanoseconds after the laser strikes. Um, you see it ablates to the right at high speed. At our laser intensities, around 10 to the 13 watts per square centimeter, the bulk debris is actually carbon plus four. And, and from now on, I will call this the debris. So the debris ions, those are the laser plasma ions that explode into the ambient. So they move at 600 kilometers per second with a large velocity spread. The coupling from the laser to the debris ion kinetic energy is very efficient can get 50% into debris ions. Um, all right, so before I show you some data, I want to say a few words about how these shocks work. This is a schematic of a magnetosonic shock. So here's the upstream region. This is the actual shock ramp, and this is the, the downstream, the compressed region. So plasma is coming in from the left at superalphenic speed. It gets decelerated in the shock, and then when it comes out, it's subalphenic. And this is the, the, the jump across the shock, so the density, magnetic field, temperature, everything goes up. Based on the idea that these shocks evolve from a magnetosonic soliton that steepens in time, the thickness is relatively small. It's on the order of the electron skin depth, which is comparable to the electron gyro radius. And it is much smaller than the ion gyro radius. So the incoming plasma leads to a charge separation, the, the unmagnetized Ions keep going, the electrons are retarded. And this horizontal electric field leads to an E cross B drift of the magnetized electrons along the shock normal. And it's exactly this relative drift between the electrons and the ions that provides the free energy for, for instabilities to grow, to provide the dissipation uh, in these shocks. Also, the gradients, the density magnetic field, the temperature can lead to additional cross field currents, provide dissipation. Um, and then eventually, when, when the shocks get strong enough, let's say Mach 2, I'm feeling Mach 2 or higher, then this, this horizontal field and the, the potential gets so large that the ions, some of the incoming ions, get reflected. And in the plasma rest frame, it, they change momentum by a factor of two, so they actually speed up. They will return back to the upstream region where they gyrate once until they come back to the shock and now have enough energy to cross the shock. So, they can pass, and on the, on the downstream side, they are now gyrating, which uh, effectively increases the, the ion temperature. And again, it provides free energy to drive instabilities and turbulence to thermalize the plasma. So in the experiment, we have the additional complication that we have two different plasmas. We have the laser plasma and we have the ambient plasma. And what the purpose of the laser plasma is to act as a piston and shock the ambient. And this is a picture of the laser plasma about a microsecond after the laser fires. So this is 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters. This was filtered for carbon plus four, so it only shows the debris ions. And you can see that it has formed this drop-shaped bubble here. Uh, the leading edge is, is, is moving at about 600 kilometers per second, which is superalphenic. The, the black thing around is that's the ambient plasma. You can see it. And if you look at the magnetic field, shown here on the right, the color is the magnetic field. Uh, then you can see that inside the, the plasma here, inside the bubble, the field has been expelled. The same cross field currents that I was just pointing out in the shock, they will actually create a magnetic field in the opposite direction that expels the field. In the simple MHD picture, you could say the highly conducting laser plasma is pushing the field out of the way and compressing it ahead so this is the diamagnetic bubble, a field-free region, and the field gets compressed 
on the outside. And this is also the magnetic pulse which eventually will, will steepen into a shock if, if, you, if you let it uh, grow long enough. So it turns out for the purpose of coupling, turbulence isn't really that efficient here, it's effective. Um, so coupling between the laser plasma and the ambient here is due to large scale laminar electric fields. And if you look at the electron momentum equation coupled with Ampere's law, then you see that there's several factors that can create an electric field for the coupling. Um, this is the pressure gradient, which we typically ignore. Uh, you can have uh, magnetic field gradients or curvature. And most importantly, in our case, you can have this ion term. So you have a, a term that depends on the ion current of the laser debris cross the magnetic field. This is called the Lamor term. This dominates for superalphanic explosions. And it will point downwards in this picture. So the ion current, J, points to the right. The magnetic field comes, goes sorry, it to the port, so it points down. Okay, and if you look at the errors here, the, the errors in this picture show the electric field. You can see there's a strong radial field that the, slows down the, uh, the debris. That's actually from this term. But in the magnetic pulse, everything kind of points downwards, if, if you look very carefully. Okay. So we can see this in the experiment. And I'm just going to show you two sets of two movies here. This, again, is a picture of the debris. This is filtered for carbon plus 4, 50 by 50 centimeters. The target is here, and the, the plasma explodes to the right. And there's a magnetic field going into the board. This picture is the same, but now it's filtered for the helium background. And so it will only show, show the, the ambient plasma. And in fact, for this experiment, the ambient plasma was limited in size to this region here. So there's neutral helium around it, and, and the plasma sitting here. And at this point, you can't see it because it is, it's, it's, it's too dim. So now, if I start this, you can see the laser plasma floating to the right. And eventually, it will, it will propagate through the, the ambient. There's some interesting fluid modes that develop here probably due to the low hybrid drift instability or some magnetic Rayleigh type instability. And what happens is when this debris cloud plows through the ambient, it gets intensified uh, by several orders of magnitude. And so what happens is these fluid modes, they create fast electrons which intensify the self-emission. Okay. And if you look later, that's the same picture for the ambient ions. He's running the same movie, but it, now it keeps running. See, after it has been intensified, the ambient plasma gets pushed out and up. And so this is quite remarkable, I say, because if you look at the, the mean free path of a debris ion relative to um, in, the, in the ambient plasma, it is 100 meters. The experiment is only 50 centimeters here. So the debris ions they should just move through it, but instead they do couple to the background and they push it up. And they couple through this Lamor field, which is actually vertical. So even though the electric field points down, everything is moving to the right. And you can see this here. We did spectroscopy of the self-emission. So we had a, a fiber looking up, integrating the self-emission along this line of sight. And when you look near the target at early times, then you're seeing this spectrum here shown in red. This is wavelength versus intensity. The blue curve is the helium background uh, by itself. If you just look at the LAPD plasma by itself, it shows this helium plus line. Okay. So with the debris cloud coming by, it is broadened and it is shifted to the blue, corresponding to about 200 kilometers per second speed. So that means here at this location, the ambient is actually moving downwards, which is consistent with this Lamo field. And then the ambient ions, they, they, they speed up. They, start gyrating in the background field. And then when you look further away from the target, they should be moving up. And sure enough, when you look further away at later times, you see in this spectrum here. So now it is red shifted. So the laser plasma, bottom line, the laser plasma is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. It is coupling energy and momentum to the ambient without collisions. And so now with this in mind, now we can look, actually look at the, uh, the actual shock. And this slide is a little bit busy. This summarizes what you have to do to launch a magnetosonic shock in the laboratory. This is based on work by Bashurin more than 30 years ago. And it 
it puts the Lama radius of the debris and the ambient in relation to these two scaling length. Uh, this thing here, RM, this is called the equal mass radius. And it's essentially the size of the diamagnetic bubble. Okay. And what Bashurin found is that the debris ions must have a gyro radius that is not much larger than, the, than, than this equal mass radius. If they are larger, they will just leak out of the bubble and they won't couple. Okay. So if I, in this plot here, I'm plotting the ratio of the, the piston or the debris Lama radius over this equal mass radius. In order to couple, you have to be here kind of left of around one. You can't be at very high values. Okay. Uh, the problem is now in, in the laboratory, we can use other gases. In space, everything is protons into hydrogen, but we can change the mass of the ambient plasma. And for example, if you would go to to neon or argon, then the, the alphanic Mach number will go down and the, the alphane speed will go way up. Uh, however, it would suggest you can drive shocks more easily. However, the ambient ions wouldn't be magnetized. So that's where the second term comes in, the, the so-called equal charge radius. This is the distance over which the piston ions have overrun an, an, an equal charge density. And it turns out that this is essentially the length over which Lamo coupling is effective. If you had protons exploding into hydrogen, these two scale lengths would be, would be exactly the same. But if you go to, to heavier ambient masses, then this is going down. And so the bottom line is that both the debris and the ambient must be magnetized. So these two conditions have to be fulfilled. And if I'm plotting everything in this one plot here, it means we have to be in this lower left quadrant here. Okay. Also, everything to the right of this line is super alphanic. So everything here is not a shock anyway. And these points here summarize all the, the experiments that we've performed over the years. When we started out, we could create super alphanic flows, but they wouldn't fulfill these, these uh, coupling criteria and there would be no shocks. And only once we had increased the laser energy and the laser density, the, 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 the ambient density, were we able to go in, in the right parameter regime here. Okay, so the bottom line is from the experiment point of view, you need laser energy to maximize the bubble size, to maximize this quantity here, but you also need ambient density so the alphane speed goes down and you can slow down the ambient ions. Otherwise, they are not magnetized. Okay. So I'm going to show you some data from this point here, which is a shock. And this is, these are magnetic profiles as a function of time measured with the B dot probe. Every line is one shot, and the probe has been moved to different distances from the target here. And what you can see is, this is the magnetosonic pulse, and then this is the piston, the, the piston here, the diamagnetic bubble. Uh, from the time of flight, you can calculate a speed of 600 kilometers per second, which is about Mach 2. And you can see that eventually this is stalls out, and the piston has a maximum size here maybe of a half a meter. And most importantly, this pulse at the edge of the bubble is separating eventually from the piston and it deepens into a shock. So this would be the shock. This is the upstream region, this is the downstream region. And if you look at two of those curves here where the shock has formed and you compare a case with the ambient plasma in black, and a case without the ambient plasma in red, you see there's a huge difference. You will always get the diamagnetic bubble and a little bit of compression, even in vacuum. However, only with the ambient plasma uh, will you get a compression that's consistent with the jump conditions. The leading edge is much faster, so that shows it has been, it has been energized. The, the piston is much slower, and it's also smaller. So you can see how energy has been transferred to the ambient plasma. And if you look at the profile, at this time here, then you get this. This is uh, space versus medical compression. So you see the unperturbed upstream region. You see the actual shock ramp. And then this is the shocked downstream region, which is several 10 gyro radius in size. And this would be the piston, the cavity. And we, to, to verify that this is indeed a shock, we ran hybrid simulations. So these are uh, pick ions and fluid electron simulations in two dimensions, with three dimensions for the velocities. This allows us to eliminate the shortest uh, time scale, so we can run a, a problem of the size of the experiment on a small computer. And what this shows here is a 
again, space, about 70 by 70 centimeters. The color is the magnetic field. The target is here, and uh, the plasma ablates to the right. And these little white dots are actually some of the debris ions. And if I run this, then you see how the debris ions explode to the right. They're forming this diamagnetic bubble shown in blue. And at the edge of the bubble, there's this magnetic pulse, which eventually steepens into a shock and propagates out to the right. And you can see how the debris ions actually stop at the edge of the bubble eventually. So this little strip shows the density, the ambient density. And as you can see that this pulse is carried by the ambient plasma, not by the debris ions. See, this, these are the ambient ions. So that's the shock. And in fact, if you look at this, if you look at this in, in some more detail, this plot here shows, again, the, this shows the magnetic field in color as a function of time and space. This is the bubble. This is the magnetic pulse at the edge, which eventually steepens into a shock. The shock has formed when the speed changes here. This is when the shock has formed. And if you look at the line outs at this time, shown up here, you have the magnetic field in black. So what you can see is the bubble. And then this is the shock. And in blue, you have the ambient ion density. So you can see there, uh, they correspond to each other. So the, the shock is carried by the ambient ions. The debris is shown in red. The debris has already stopped. And the shock and the ambient ions are keep going. And this is the phase space. Velocity is a function of distance from the target for the debris in red and for the ambient in blue. And you can see how some of the debris has been stopped. The ambient has been swept out from this region and has been sped up to, uh, to Mach 2. And most importantly, you can see this little ring here. This is actually a signature of reflected ions, which provide dissipation in this shock. The hybrid code does not include uh, the turbulence that, that provides dissipation in the shock. So the only, only dissipation that we have here is reflected ions. OK, so this is the perpendicular case. So now I'm going to talk about the parallel case. This is more interesting probably for this audience because the parallel shocks are formed by electromagnetic ion ion stability. So this depends much more on turbulence. And it's essentially the same experiment. We use the LAPD. We use the same laser, but in a different geometry. So the target is now in the center of the machine, and the surface is actually facing along the magnetic field. And the beam is coming in here with the large mirror inside the vacuum vessel so that we can irradiate the, the surface. The debris explodes exactly along the plasma column in the magnetic field. And this gives us much more space. We now have, say, 15 meters of plasma to interact with. Um, in this case, the formation depends on electromagnetic ion, ion instabilities. So there is, for ions moving along the field, there is really no bubble. There's no piston. There will be a little bubble because some ions are moving at angles. But the diamagnetic bubble is not really important here. What is important is that you have superalphanic debris ions moving along the plasma. And these shocks require more space. They require about 100 ion inertial length. But we also have a lot more space along this direction. Okay, so. There are two electromagnetic ion ion stabilities that are particularly important for alphanic shocks. One is the so-called right-hand instability, or RHI. This is a, simply a gyro resonance between the debris ion and a magnetosonic wave. So this is a right-handed -hand, right instability. And what it can do is it can pitch angle scatter ambient ions, which actually leads to a compression in the transverse direction. So that's not really what we want. We, what we would want is coupling to the background in the longitudinal direction. Um, however, this right-hand instability has, a very, has, has really no threshold for the onset of, of, of growth. And so it's dominant when the debris ion density is less than the background density, which is, which is the case in our experiment. Uh, it still needs to be super alphanic. And in fact, this plot here shows the growth rate for this right-hand instability as a function of Mach number, alphanic Mach number, and ratio between beam density and ambient density. And so the redder it is, the, the, the faster it will grow. And so you can see these points indicate where the experiment is. 
depending on the laser energy, and so we should easily see it. Even at less energy, we should see it. Uh, more interesting later on will be this non-resonant instability, or NRI, and this uh, requires more beam density. Um, it also needs to be super thin. What this will do is it can uh, accelerate the background ions. The NRI is essentially a, a shear wave, a shear alpha wave that becomes nonlinear, while, while this is a magnetosonic wave. Okay. So for now, the goal of the experiment was to just create a, a field parallel debris cloud that's superalphanic, that travels through the LAPD over several meters, and uh, is dense enough to excite the right-hand instability. Later on, the, the, we will try to excite the non-resonant instability and actually see a shock wave. So, since this depends critically on the debris ions, I want to say a few words about the debris ions here. And in fact, we can measure this with the Langmuir probe. So it's just a conducting tip uh, several meters from the target that collects the ion current. And so you can see the arrival of ions. And from this, we can just calculate the spectrum. So this plot here shows the ion current as a function of speed. And the black curve is this Langmuir probe data. And you can see it peaks here at around 300 kilometers per second, which is Mach 2.5 or so. But there will be fast ions all the way up to 500 or 600 kilometers per second. There will also be many slower ions. And in addition, we, we can look at separate charge states with the, with the spectrometer. So for example, we can look at fluorescence from carbon plus four, which, are, which is our bulk debris. And then we get this, this distribution here. So what this shows you is essentially that the bulk is indeed carbon-4, but there's faster stuff that has to be some other charge state. We can't see this at the moment. It could be carbon plus 5, it could be carbon plus 6, it could be protons. And when you look at carbon plus 2, it's, it's here, it's the slower stuff. So, so apparently there's also some carbon plus 3. Okay. The, the reason why I'm telling you this is uh, this velocity spread is even bigger because we have a spread of charge states. And the velocity spread is, is crucial in this experiment because it leads to a drop in density. So if you look at, at different distances from the target, if you're going, let's say, to five meters, seven meters, the total ion current is significantly lower simply because of the longitudinal velocity spread. And that means near the target, the, the conditions for the growth of the right-hand instability is fulfilled. Far away, it isn't. And so now if I show you what happens to the magnetic field, this, these are magnetic field traces a function of time for different distances from the target in meters. Okay, and what you can see is at any position, you're getting these high frequency oscillations at early times, and there's actually a frequency uh, chirp. It starts at high frequency and then it's low frequency, and, and then we see a shear wave later on. And if you look at one of those traces, do for it Fourier transform or a wavelet analysis, you're getting frequency as a function of time, then you're getting this frequency chirp here. The color, the white, the white uh, color scale, that, that's actually the power. And this colored curve here, this shows the dispersion relation for the right-hand instability. And it agrees remarkably well. It even shows here in red, that's the highest growth. It even shows uh, where would you expect the, the highest frequency. So at this point, we're very <laughs> convinced that we're already seeing the right-hand instability. And I just want to show you one brief <laughs> hybrid simulation of this case here. This is the dire direction along the, the LAPD. This is transverse to it. It's distorted. So this di direction is much longer than this one in reality. Okay. On the left, we have the debris density. This is the magnetic field transverse to the external field. And this is the ambient density. And when I'm running this, you can see the debris ions flying to the right, they gyrate around here. Most importantly, <coughs> we're seeing these right end uh, polarized waves, high frequency early on, then lower frequency at later times. And if you look at the ambient density, there's nothing happening at this point. So uh, according to the simulation, we are launching waves, but they're not nearly large enough to actually accelerate the ambient plasma, which you need for a shock to form. But if you compare the magnetic probe data on the left, this is magnetic field as a function of time, at one given position, far away from the target, right, where you get the high frequency stuff and the lower frequency, 
the simulation shows essentially the same. It shows the same dynamics. It shows the same amplitude, in fact, even. Several Gauss here. Um, so bottom line is we are exciting the right hand stability, but it's at this point not enough to launch a shock. And what we do want is the ambient to start moving. This is a hybrid simulation that we run out over longer times. So again, this is the, the distance along the plasma column. This is the velocity of the ambient at different times. This red curve here shows the current length of the plasma in ion inertial length. So that's limited by the size of the LAB. Uh, so there isn't much happening. You would have to go further out, which means either we would need a longer plasma or you need more density and then the ion inertial length goes down and then, then we would be able to see it in the LAPD. But I want to point out that there's, there's an upgrade going on for the LAPD that will do this, will boost the density. And there's also another device at, uh, at UCLA that may become available at some point that, that would have a much longer plasma. So it seems feasible in the future to actually let the debris cloud propagate through the plasma long enough for, for a shock to form. And that's all I really have here. So bottom line, so far we only studied the, the formation. The formation of magnetic sonic shocks we think is well understood. Now what we haven't done at all yet is really actually look at the properties of these shocks, in particular the turbulence. But I hope I made the point that there is plenty of turbulence going on that's worth looking at. Um, in particular, electromagnetic ion ion stabilities for alphenic shocks. And we think in the near future we'll be able to, to launch uh, also non-resonant instability and actually shocks and look at turbulence in more detail. Thank you.